All right, we are back live from the Oasis. Guys, I'm with you now. Mike Davis here. Glad you are joining us. We're going to pray and get right into our study for today, my, my study and my time in, in this portion of our study. So, Father, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into all of your truth. And we look to him to guide us this morning as we study your word so we can better understand your will, your way, and walk in your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... We are still in our study, no surprise, called Who's the Boss? Women uh, and Men in Biblical and Cultural Contexts. We've been exploring, and, and, and it's been a couple of weeks since I've been here, but we've, what we've been exploring is complementarian objections to the idea that there were female false teachers present at Ephesus. If you've got your Bibles, open to 1 Timothy chapter 2, because a lot of the basis for complementarian saying that women cannot have equal authority with men in the church, and some will extend it even to the home, is based upon certain passages of scriptures, one of them, not the only one, but one of them being, one of the main ones being 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, this is where I'm going to start here, it says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first and Eve, and Eve was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. We've been looking at this passage in great depth in detail. And what we've seen is that, there, that, that the way I have interpreted this text and the way many egalitarian scholars interpret this text is that the women who were teaching at Ephesus were teaching false doctrine. They were teaching uh, things that were contrary to sound doctrine. They were contrary to the will of God, to the word of God, to the truth of God. And so what Paul was prohibiting here is not all women being forbidden to teach in all places in all times, and he was not forbidding women from having authority co-equal with men in the church, therefore that they could teach and lead other men also. He was not forbidding that. We're saying that he was only forbidding certain women, and as I have taught, certain wealthy, well-to-do women, if you read verse 9 all the way down, and if you go back and look to previous videos, I go into great depth and detail as to why I believe this is so, based upon the context and the culture of the time, that Paul is forbidding these women who are well-to-do, there's a, there, there's a, it's a, not necessarily a large group of women, um, and it's not every woman in the fellowship at Ephesus or in the community, the church community at Ephesus, but it's a group of women who are spreading false teaching. It is these women that Paul is saying, I do not permit them to teach. Or it could be a specific woman that Paul is saying, I do not permit uh, a woman to teach, nor to, uh, and the word is, we have in our English Bibles, uh, to have authority or to exercise authority. The Greek term is authentain which I believe should be interpreted according to Dr. Cindy Westfall. It should be, I do not permit a woman to dominate or, or to domineer a man. Now, as we said before, that man could be referring to, a, to other males or it could be referring to a husband or it could be referring to the male teachers, okay? My point is that um, we don't necessarily have to zero in on who specifically is it talking to. It's the idea that these women are not who are teaching falsely, they're also dominating, they're, they're being domineering, they're exercising a domineering authority, and they're not supposed to do that. They're exercising it over other males. We're not, uh, whether you say it's the their husbands, whether you say it's male teachers, or whether you just say it's other men in the fellowship, they are not supposed to be doing this, okay? It's not talking about apostolic or pastoral authority or the authority of elders. This is a domination. This is a domineering. And we explain why we, we believe on the egalitarian side why this is so. So this is what Paul is forbidding. Women who are teaching falsely and exercising a domineering influence that's contrary to the will of God. Okay? So that's the egalitarian point of view for the most part. That's the, the, the widely held consensus. Now, Mike Winger objects to and rejects, he objects to and he rejects the egalitarian interpretation that states that there were female false teachers at Ephesus, as well as other complementarian scholars. There are other, there are complementarian scholars who also reject this. Mike Winger, as a Bible teacher, also holds to the complementarian view 
that says, no, there were no female false teachers. What Paul is prohibiting in verse 12 is not female false teachers. He is preventing, pro, uh, pro, uh, prohib, prohibiting all teachers, oh, excuse me, all females from teaching apostolic doctrine or correct doctrine. So it's not just false doctrine. Of course, Paul would be against that. But he's also prohibiting women from teaching what we could call apostolic doctrine, uh, correct doctrine to men, that they're not supposed to exercise authority over men. One of the ways they do that is by teaching uh, like a pastor or an elder in a church. And that is a, quote, role, this is what complementarians say, that is denied them. Now, egalitarian says, nope, this is this is not the way to interpret the text. Uh, complementarian says, no, that is the way to interpret the text. Paul is not prohibiting false teachers, a, a specific group. He's prohibiting all women from teaching men in all places at all times, even if it's correct doctrine. Okay, that's the complementarian point of view. As a matter of fact, this is what Mike Winger, in video 12 of his series, Women in Ministry, this is what he says. Let me read to you a quote that he states there. He says, the first step is the claim, talking about the first steps in terms of the egalitarian claim, is to claim that First Timothy is primarily concerned with false teachers and false teachings. The, impl the implication here is that there's enough of a background of false teachers in First Timothy that we can see false teachers as the unstated issue in 1 Timothy 2.12. We see so much false teaching going on in Ephesus, Ephesus that we can just assume or we can sort of imply or infer that that is what Paul is talking about in 1 Timothy 2. He said this is the egalitarian point of view. It is not women teaching, but women teaching falsely. Now, th that, that part is true. We do believe that the teaching here is referring to false teaching. Okay? So Mike is saying... This is what complementarian. This is what egalitarians claim. Uh, he goes on to say, "Here's the idea," and he explains it. Women became false teachers in Ephesus, and he's explaining his perception of the egalitarian view. Women became false teachers in Ephesus, and this is, of course, absolutely crucial for the egalitarian argument to take place if they're going to succeed, at least in this line of argument that Paul is prohibiting women from teaching false doctrine. Okay. Uh, to interpret 1 Timothy 2 as an egalitarian text, then they really need this to not only to be not only a little successful, but for it to be monumentally successful. So he's saying in order to interpret 1 Timothy 2.12 as referring to female false teachers, we need this to be monumentally true. What does he mean by that? He explains. So if there are, let's say, a handful of female false teachers in 1 Timothy in that setting in Ephesus, that doesn't give you enough leverage to say, yeah, that explains why Paul forbids all women from teaching. So Mike is saying, if there's only a handful, it's only if there's only a small group of women teaching, that doesn't give you enough leverage to explain why Paul forbids all women from teaching. It's just unreasonable to think that this is the explanation for a wide, just complete barring of women from teaching and having authority over men if it's a handful of women. So you need such a huge problem of female false teachers that, that, that it's a solution to actually bar women entirely from teaching. That's what egalitarian needs. So now what Mike has done here is reframed the argument. Egalian, egalitarians do not say, number one, that the prohibition, I do not permit a woman to teach, applies to all women. Egalitarians say it only applies to the women who are teaching falsely and being domineering. Mike has reframed the argument to say, oh, egalitarians, in, for, in order for their interpretation to work, you don't need a handful of teachers, of, of, of female false teachers. You need a huge amount of false teachers, or else why would Paul say that he is banning all women from teaching? So he's making it sound like egalitarians are saying, yes, Paul has banned all women from teaching because of a handful of women. That's not what egalitarians say. That's not what egalitarians teach. That's what how Mike has reframed the argument. This is, again, what we call creating a straw man. You take what someone has said, you recast it in a different light, you cause the author or the speaker to say something they didn't say, and then you argue against the 
the, the, the restatement of the argument that you came up with. We do not say as egalitarians that it's only a handful of teachers. Therefore, this is why Paul banded on everyone. We say it was only a group of women who were teaching falsely and being domineering. And it is these women that Paul is prohibiting to teach and to be domineering, not exercise authority, because egalitarians do not hold that we're talking about pastoral authority in 1 Timothy 2.12. We said this is women being a certain group of women being domineering. So it doesn't apply to all women. That's the argument. So Mike gets that wrong when he re when he says it, when he states it in that way. And again, you can see this in video 12, starting at the eighth hour and 38 minutes, and about 33 seconds is where he makes this argument. And that's just simply not true, that in order to uh, to have this argument, to make this egalitarian text, we need a large group of women uh, to a, a large group of female false teachers in order for Paul's statement to make any sense. No, you don't need a, a large group of women for Paul's uh, statement to make any sense because we've never said that Paul is banning all women. It is a group of women who are teaching falsely and not that they are exercising proper pastoral authority, they are being domineering. That is the correct egalitarian argument, which Mike actually, uh, he changes in order to make his argument against the egalitarian view, okay? So um, if, if Mike Winger, and, and there is a, a, another teacher by the name of Wayne Grudem, if they are correct in terms of what Paul is saying, uh, matter of fact, let me read to you what Wayne Grudem said. This is what, because Mike in his video, number 12, at eight minutes, at eight hours and 39 minutes, he quotes Wayne Grudem. He says, Wayne Grudem puts this correctly when he says the following, unless women were primarily responsible for spreading the false teaching, Paul's silencing of the women in the egalitarian view would not make sense. And then Mike says, and this is significant because the only false teachers that we're aware of specifically are men. At least that is what I thought. And that has been my impression as I read First Timothy and as I read the related passages. So Mike is quoting um, as to, to prove what he's saying, Dr. Wayne Grudem from his book, Evangelical Feminism and Biblical Truth. I went and read the passage where Grudem says this. And he says, yeah, Wayne Grudem agrees with this, that women had to be the primary uh, teachers of the false doctrine and that in order for Paul in order in order for let me let me read again he uh he says unless women were primarily responsible for spreading the false teaching Paul's silencing of the women in the egalitarian view would not make sense but again that's a misstatement and a misunderstanding of the egalitarian view Paul is not banning all women as we have seen in previous studies, Paul are banning women who are not educated in the scriptures. Paul is banning the women, and they show that they're not educated in the scriptures by the false teaching that they are sharing and by them being domineering, which would show that they're not really grounded in the teachings of Jesus who teaches against being domineering. These are the people that Paul is saying, I do not permit them to teach. Teach what? their false doctrine. And I do not permit them to be domineering. That's what it's referring to, okay? So the reason Mike makes this type of arguments because if, if he and Grudem, this is what I was gonna say, if if Mike Winger and Wayne Grudem are correct, then th what this means is that Paul, in other words, if they're correct by saying, well, Paul couldn't be referring, uh, if if Paul is, is banning all women, th that would mean, all, that, that the primary false teachers had to be, uh, excuse me, that the false teachers had to be primarily women and it had to be a large group of women. No. Now, if this is true, then this would mean that Paul, if, if their view is correct, it would mean that Paul's words in 1 Timothy 2.12 are not referring to false teachers or females sharing false teaching. And this would mean that Paul is prohibiting, that he is prohibiting for, he's prohibiting all women for, for all times and in all places from being pastors and elders and teachers of men, he's permitting them to not hold equal authority in the church with men. If Wayne Grudem and Mike Winger's view are correct, and what I'm saying is their view is not correct because that's not the egalitarian view and you do not need a huge group of female false teaching for Paul to say, I do not permit 
these women who are teaching falsely and being domineering, I don't permit them to teach in the church. These women who also are not educated, I do not permit them. And when, by education, we mean scriptural education, not as Mike Winger says, a secular education. It has nothing to do with secular education. It has to do with a lack of scriptural understanding and knowledge and wisdom. Okay? So, but if it, the way they argue it, it would mean, oh, okay, well, you know, it has to be a large group of women. No, it doesn't have to be a large group of women. And here's the thing too. In 1 Timothy chapter one, Paul talks about, and, and there, by the way, there are only two male false teachers that are named in 1 Timothy. And that is uh, in 1 Timothy chapter two, verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander. These are the only two false teachers that are named. Now, these are not the only teachers at Ephesus. These are just the two that are named. And I believe they are named because they have been kicked out of the congregation. Paul said, I've turned them over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. This is usually meaning that they have been excommunicated. They are no longer part of the community. But here's the thing. Paul names these two teachers. He only names two. But does that, does that mean that because he only names two that the rest of the false teachers are, are, are okay to teach? In other words, Paul didn't name a huge group of false teachers in order to permit false teaching, because Paul says to Timothy, I left you behind at Ephesus in order that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, that they don't teach false doctrine. Well, Paul only named two teachers. He didn't name like 30 teachers or even 15 teachers in order to say, hey, Timothy, this is why I let you there, because there's like 15 different teachers. He only named two, but there were other teachers there. My point being is you don't need a large group of, uh, of teachers to say, hey, I don't permit this false teaching from going on. Th I think of it like this. We have our church, the Oasis, okay? And let's say I, you know, I'm, I'm one of the, the, the leading teachers there. My wife is a leading teacher there. Aaron Richard, whom you saw earlier, he's one of the lead teachers there. So let's say Karen and myself and Aaron, we all went away and we left some other members in charge Say, well, you guys are going to be teaching while we're gone. While we're gone, we find out that somebody's been coming in teaching what is contrary to scripture. One person teaching contrary to scripture. Let's say I wrote a letter back and I said, hey, look, we do not permit that type of teaching in this church. This person cannot teach. And let's say this person is also being abusive in their teaching and they're putting people down. And I would write a letter, let's say to one of the members of our fellowship, her name is Cheryl. Cheryl, I'm going to make you a, a teacher. And I said to Cheryl, hey, Cheryl. And Cheryl wrote me and she said, hey, Mike, this is what's going on. How do you want us to handle this? And I said, Cheryl, I'll write our letter. We do not permit people to teach that type of doctrine. And we do not permit that type of abuse in our fellowship. Now, does this mean that no one else in our fellowship is allowed to teach? No, this only applies to those who are teaching contrary to what we allow in the fellowship. They're teaching what is wrong and they're being abusive. It wouldn't apply to the people that I've said you are allowed to teach. It would only apply to those, to that one person who is teaching something that is contrary to God's will. So when Paul writes and says, I do not permit a, a woman to teach, he's speaking about specific women teaching false doctrine. And he says, and, and I do not permit a woman to, to be domineering over men. These are specific people. You don't need a huge group of people. I really don't understand that, that argumentation that you need like a huge group of people in order to prevent uh, or, or in order to prohibit a small group of people to say, you can't do this. Okay. So that I, I wanted to bring that point up. And so again, as I was saying before, Mike Winger objects to the egalitarian view um, that there are female false teachers. Part of Mike's objection to the egalitarian view that there are female false teachers in 1 Timothy is that his rejection of 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, as referring to females who are spreading false teachings. Now, let me let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse and verse 13. I'll, we'll actually start at verse, um, verse. Uh, let's go start at verse 11. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. Verse 13. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Now, there, Mike rejects this as referring to females spreading false teachings or female false teachers 
in the church. There are egalitarians who believe that this passage of scripture is also speaking to and speaking about females in the congregation who have been deceived and they are spreading the false teachers to other members of the congregation, okay? That is the belief of many egalitarians. Now, Mike objects to this and he says, no, this is not true. And let me, so let me read to you what he actually says. Again, this is from his series, um, Women in Ministry, video number 12. He says at the eighth hour and timestamp eight hours and 39 minutes and 58 seconds, in case you want to go look it up. He said, there are some egalitarians who say, no, no, no. We have indications that there are female false teachers that are going house to house, that are spreading false teaching, and that he talks about this in 2 Timothy. Now, I'll explain that in a moment. So Mike says, so we are going to read about this in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, places where supposedly there are female false teachers specifically called out by Paul. And he says, we're going to talk about 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13 first. So again, there are egalitarian scholars who believe that, and they see 1 Timothy 5, 13 as referring to female false teachers, that is, females in the community of the Christians at Ephesus who have been taken in by these false teachers, false teachings, they've been deceived by the false teachings, and now they are spreading the false teachers, going house to house, spreading the false teachings. Mike cites this, and he gives three reasons for how, egalitar how egalitarians interpret this as meaning and referring to female false teachers. So he gives, he says, let me share with you three reasons how they interpret this as referring to false teachers. Let me read to you again what he says. Uh, this is at timestamp eight hours and 40 minutes and 51 seconds on video number 12. Mike says, quote, there are three ways in which an egalitarian might use this verse, 1 Timothy 5.13, to say here that there are, are women false teachers, or to, to use this verse to say here are women false teachers, okay? Let me read that again. There's three ways in which an egalitarian might use this verse to say here are women false teachers that Paul specifically calls out in 1 Timothy, giving them giving them that leverage to reinterpret 1 Timothy 2.9 to interpret in a different way than at least what I think an honest person would say seems obvious from a simple reading of the text here. So Mike is saying that these three ways that egalitarians read the text to say this is referring to female false teachers, it gives them a way to reinterpret the text. But then he makes this statement, at least what I think, it, it, it reinterprets it in a different way at least from what I think an honest person would seem would, would say seems obvious from a simple reading of the text. Now that's problematic to me. What he's saying is an honest person reading this text would not read it in the way that egalitarians are reading it. This is called poisoning the well. He, he asserts something about the text and the reading of the text before he actually proves it. Okay. So he is saying an honest person would see this as obvious that this is not referring to uh, female false teachers. This would imply that egalitarian scholars are not being honest. That's problematic. That's called, in terms of, of logic and debate, that's called poisoning the well. You, you insert something to make people start thinking something like, well, you know, an honest person would read it this way. Therefore, if you don't read it in the way that I read it, you're not being honest. That's not a good way to do scholarship. Okay, here's Mike's, and I had to bring that up because I was reading it and I went, that's really bad, okay? Here's Mike's three ways that he says in, in, in egalitarians interpret this text that where they are able to see it as referring to female false teachers. He said the first is the phrase, is that phrase, house to house. They'll think that when these women go about from house to house, because it says here that they go from house to house, they think that this is a reference to going from church gathering to church gathering, not just building to building, home to home, but local church gatherings that are happening across Ephesus, Ephesus, that they're heading to one to perhaps be kind of like a teacher, then to another, then to another. So house to house refer, refers to that. So Mike is saying egalitarians see this as that uh, this is that they read this as these female teachers are going from house to house or from church gathering to church gathering in order to spread these teachings. So, so that's one, they see this as referring to going to church gatherings. Two, he says, second, the second phrase, saying what they should not. Now this is again in 1 Timothy 5.13, that they are busy, that, that these women are idle, wandering from house to house. 
not only idle, but also gossiping and busybodies, busybodies saying things which they ought not. So in terms of that phrase, saying things which they ought not, Mike says, Paul says that they are saying things that they shouldn't say, and that egalitarians, that that implies teaching. And he's going to agree, disagree that that, that that is referring to teaching. And then the third way is that they'll say that the word gossip, that we just read, that they are gossip, gossiping or gossipers, that the word gossips in 1 Timothy 5.13 5.13 has been mistranslated, that it actually means false teachers. Then Mike says, now that's a surprising claim that we actually see, and you certainly wouldn't have expected this. That, that doesn't mean it's wrong. I'm just saying that, hey, surprise, there are egalitarian arguments that most of you probably never heard of, and we're evaluating those as well, so that the word gossip, that it's just a mistranslation, that it refers ultimately to, or indicates perhaps, I should say, more cautiously, it indicates false teachers, even if it doesn't mean that exactly. Now, Mike is saying what egalitarians are teaching from this passage is that the word gossip, when it says that they go from house to house, uh, and they're not only, only idle, but also gossips and busybodies. And he's saying that the word gossip here is egalitarians are saying that this, re, this means this means false teachers, or it indicates um, false teachers, even if it doesn't mean that exactly, okay? So he's going to deal, if you go back and watch his video, or you can just listen to me quote what he says, he's, he's going to deal with each of these three uh, reasons that egalitarians give for why this passage is or could be referring to female false teachers, and that's a problem, okay? Now, the reason he has to deal with this is because, and he, from his perspective, he is going to disprove this, that no, it is not referring to, to churches, it's not referring to them going to church to church, it is not referring to them uh, teaching things that are false doctrine, and it's not referring to them as being false teachers. He's going to go through all three of those, and what I'm going to do is share with you what he says one by one, and then I'm going to offer my pushback on what he says, because there I'm going to bring out some more evidence, okay? All right, let me also read uh, what he says here. Let me see, I got the right one here. Okay, no, let, let me stop there. So let me say this. Egalitarian scholars, they do see First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, as referring to female false teachers because of parallel language that is seen in other passages dealing with false teachers. Uh, and of course, the three ways that scholars see this as referring to false teachers. So let me back up again. So false teachers, uh, not false teachers, egalitarian teachers will look at this passage and say, this is referring to female false teachers, because when we look at other passages that are that are parallel, the other passages that deal with false teachers, we see language in these other passages that parallel what we see or that are similar to what we see in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. So this is part of the reasons why they believe it is referring to female false teachers. Now, of course, Mike rejects this. So we're going to re we're going to look at his objections. We're going to deal with just one of them today because as I was putting this together, I went, whoa, there's a whole lot of information. I'm not going to try to cover it all at once or we'd be here for two hours or three hours. So I'm going to cover just one objection today and we'll try to cover the next two next week because he has three, there are three areas that he cites as the reasons why egalitarians see 1 Timothy 5.13 as referring to female false teachers. He has three objections to those three reasons and we're going to deal with one of those today. So one of the things that Mike does, he quotes Dr. Linda Belleville, whom, by the way, I got a chance to meet at ETS, took a picture with her. Uh, he quotes Dr. Linda Belleville, uh, she, who makes a statement in the book, Discovering Biblical Equality. So let me read to you what Dr. Linda Belleville says. And, this, and Mike, in his video, quotes this passage from this book, Discovering Biblical Equality, uh, and... This book is subtitled uh, Biblical the Theological, Cultural, and Practical Perspectives. And this is from page 207 of the book. It is the article by Dr. Linda Belleville called Teaching and Usurping Authority. Mike quotes this uh, passage that I'm going to read to you in his video. Quote, this is what Dr. Uh, uh, Belleville wrote. Further, the parallel language between the itinerant women at Ephesus going from house to house, saying things they ought not, um, 
First Timothy 5, which is from First Timothy 5, 13, and the false teachers at Crete, disrupting whole households by teaching things that they ought not to teach, Titus 1, 11, is striking. So Dr. Belleville is, is saying that we see parallel language in First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, where it says the women are going from house to house, saying things that they ought not. And then in Titus chapter 1, verse 11, we see that the false teachers at Crete it is said of them that they are disrupting whole household by teaching what they ought not to teach. And she says, this is striking. So let's go over to Titus chapter 1 and verse 11. It's just a few books over, a couple of books over. You got 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus. Titus chapter 1, we'll start at verse 10. And Paul is here dealing with false teachers. He writes to Titus, for there are many insubordinate, insubordinate both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole household, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So Paul is saying here that these are teachers who are idle talkers and they are subverting whole households, meaning that they are going into households in other words, they're going from household to household, subverting the household, ruining the household, and they're saying things, excuse me, they are teaching things that they ought not to teach. Dr. Belleville and other egalitarian scholars have looked at this and says, wait a minute, that is amazingly similar, parallel to what Paul says about the young widows in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. He says that they are idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. So Dr. Belleville says, look, there's parallel language here. This is really striking. And she says this within the context of proving that there are female teachers. Now, Mike in the video will say she doesn't come to any conclusion when, when she makes this statement. I would disagree. If you go back and you read from the very beginning, and this is again something that, and and it's not that big of a deal. It may be that he's just thinking that there's not a conclusion here, um, but in context, and and I have a problem sometimes when Mike doesn't read everything in its context. She says in page two seven. So if we go up to the beginning of the paragraph. She says because when Mike quote what I just read to you, which Mike also reads, it's about a third of the way down, almost toward the end of the paragraph. At the beginning of the paragraph, Dr. Belleville says this, some are quick to point out that there are no explicit examples of female false teachers in 1 Timothy, and they are correct. There are no explicit examples of female false teachers. And she goes on to say, no women, teachers or otherwise, are specifically named. Yet this overlooks the fact that attention to false teaching and women that, that it, it, it may be Stop, slow, slow down, goes back. Yet this overlooks the fact that attention to false teaching in women occupies about 60% of the letter. It would therefore be foolish, not to mention misleading, to neglect considering 1 Timothy 2 against this backdrop. What backdrop? That 60% of the letter has to deal with false teaching and women. She goes on to say that the false teachers forbid people to marry, which is in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, we read where they are, that the, one of the, the teachings is that they forbid people to marry. She said that, that the false teachers forbid people to marry, explaining Paul's stress that women will be saved or preserved through the birth of the child in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, uh, and as well as his command in 1 Timothy 5, 14, that the younger widows marry and raise family, which is different from his teaching elsewhere about the value of not marrying. So in, in 513, Paul talks about these women going from house to house. They're being idle. They're gossiping, being busybodies, saying, th saying things which they ought not. He says, I want them to marry and to bear children. Now, this is contrary to the teachings of the false teachers. Then she goes on to say, also, the language of deception is used of both the Ephesian women and the false teachers. The false teachers, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse chapter first Tim, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, the false teachers deceive others and themselves. While the Ephesians women are reminded that it was Eve who was deceived and became a sinner. So she's drawing parallels. She says, look, when we look in 2 Timothy, we see that Paul says of the false teachers 
that they are deceived and deceiving others. We see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where the women who Paul is prohibiting to teach, he's reminding them that Eve was deceived and became a sinner. So again, parallel language about deception. Then she says, further, the parallel language between the itinerant women at Ephesus going from house to house, saying things they ought not in 1 Timothy 5.13, and the false teachers at Crete, which we just read about, disrupting whole households by teaching things that they ought not to teach, Titus 1.11, is striking. So Dr. Belleville, contrary to what Mike is saying in his video, she's not being unclear. She is drawing a conclusion. She's saying, look, there's parallel language here. And when we look at this parallel language, we see that the teachers are deceived and deceiving. We see that Eve was deceived and deceiving, which implies that the women teachers who are teaching falsely, they are deceived and they are deceiving. We see that they're wandering from household to household. We see in first, we see in Titus chapter one that false teachers are subverting whole household. We see in first Timothy chapter five, verse 13, that the women that Dr. Belleville is saying are, are deceived, that they are saying things which they ought not. We see in Titus chapter one, verse 11, that the false teachers are teaching things that they ought not. So she sees parallels there, and she's the, her point is there are those who say, hey, there are no false teachers being mentioned. She says, but when you look at the parallel, she says, yes, there are no women who are explicitly named as false teachers. However, she says, when you look at the parallels, the idea is it points to these women are teaching things that are false. They too are deceived, okay? So that is her point when you read it in its entire context. Now, again, Mike rejects this. Uh, Dr. Belleville sees the parallels, but Mike does not believe that the language is really parallel and that he doesn't believe that the language in 1 Timothy 5.13 uh, indicates false teaching. He doesn't believe that. He doesn't believe that this language in 513, where it says that the women are gossips and busybodies and saying things that ought not, that they ought not, he does not believe that this is referring to false teaching. Therefore, it is not referring to female false teachers. Mike says in his teaching that Titus 111, it may refer to house churches, or it could simply refer to people's homes. Again, if we go back to Titus chapter one, if we go back to Titus chapter one, again, and look at what it says, it says that there are many, in verse 10, there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought now. So they are subverting whole households, teaching things which they ought not. Let me take a sip of water for a moment. Excuse me. What's my point here? Well, Mike says, it's not clear, is this, ref or when it says they're subverting whole households, is it talking about churches that are meeting in the household? Uh, in other words, that these households are churches, or is it simply talking about people's homes? And he says, to his, to his credit, he says, it's unsure. He says, it could be referring to churches, that they're subverting churches, or it could be just referring to people's homes, that they're going in and subverting people's homes. And he says, it's not sure. I'll give him that. I'll go like, yeah, yeah, not completely 100% clear. Now, there are some scholars who says, hey, this, because the early believers met in home, this is talking about churches. But he could make the point, and I, would, I wouldn't contest it too much, he said, it's, it's a little bit unclear, so it may not be referring to churches, but stay with me. So according to Mike, because this is unclear, he says, there is nothing in 1 Timothy 5.13 to indicate that Paul is referring to house churches. Even though it says that the women are going from house to house, Mike denies that this is referring to house churches. He says, and let me read to you, I'm do it with my paper. Oh, here it is. Let me read you what Mike says. This is again from timestamp, eight hours and 44 minutes. He said, nothing in that, 1 Timothy 5.13, nothing indicates house churches. That's why Paul doesn't say, greet the house of so-and-so. When he's talking about the church that gathers in that house, he says, greet the church that gathers in that home. They're not synonymous with churches. In other words, house to house is not synonymous with churches. Um, 
So Mike does not see the women going from house to house as meaning they're going from church to church. He says they're not synonymous. And this is what I say in regards to this. This is not a well-researched or well-reasoned or a well-thought-out argument for Mike, in my opinion. He did not reason this well. He did not. It's not well-reasoned. It's not well-argued. It's not well-thought-out. Now, here's why. And let me, so this is, I'm going to share with you my pushback to Mike. Now, let me say this too. You said, Mike, why are you going into detail? Once again, because by saying that there are not female false teachers in Ephesus, and that this is what Paul is referring to in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, when he says, I do not permit a woman to teach, he's referring to female false teachers. By saying that, no, there are no female false teachers, this confirms the complementarian view that Paul is prohibiting all women in all places at all times from holding positions of authority and of co-leadership with men, that women cannot have co-leadership with men, that they are to be subordinate, they cannot teach other men. It would uphold, by saying there are no female teachers, it would uphold that complementarian point of view and interpretation. So the reason I am dealing with this in detail is to show that, no, that just doesn't, it doesn't hold water to say that there are no female teachers, okay? So this is to argue for female teachers are allowed, female teachers can have equal authority with men in the fellowship, okay? From an egalitarian point of view. So here's my pushback. First of all, the New Testament scriptures are clear that believers met house to house in order to receive teaching. Go to Acts chapter two, because keep in mind Mike's argument here. When it says that the women in 1 Timothy 5.13 went from house to house, Mike's argument is this is not referring to church gatherings. This is just women going about gossiping and they're just going to people's homes and gossiping. That's all that is referring to according to Mike. However, the New Testament is clear that believers met house to house in order to be taught, to receive instruction. Let's go to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. And this is why I say, because Mike, when I'm getting ready to share with you, he mentions none of this in his video. He mentions none of this. So I said, it's not well researched. It's not well thought out when he made this argument. Acts, because if he had simply went to some of these scriptures that we're going to look at, he'd had to make a different argument. Acts chapter two, let's look at verse um, 40. Acts chapter two, verse 40. Acts two, verse 40. And it says, and this is the day of Pentecost. And with many other words, he, Peter, testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, look at verse 42. Oh, we just read verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. It says, they notice they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teachings and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 46, so continually daily with one another, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So we hear they are meeting daily and they are daily being taught. Now, I read one article where somebody said, oh, no, no, they're being taught in the temple. They weren't being taught house to house. Now, notice that it says here they were breaking bread from house to house. Let me read to you from Dr. Craig Keener, who also got a chance to meet at ETS for the very first time. This is his IVP Bible background commentary of the New Testament. This is what he has to say on these verses that I just read to you from Acts. I oh, thought I had it, and I didn't. Let me get it for you. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 um, this is what he says. Um, yeah, he says, verse 42. Now, verse 42, again, let me read to you what it says. Then we're going to read the cultural background. Verse 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread, meaning they ate together, and in prayers. Now, when I was reading that, I, I thought to myself, wait a minute. If I remember correctly, in my study of, of the ancient Greco-Roman world, when people would eat together, there would usually be lectures and teachings after they, they ate. 
Okay, and I thought, well, let me go look this up to make sure I am correct. So I, I find this, Dr. Craig Keener, he says, verse 42, most groups in antiquity, in antiquity ate together, Greek associations, Pharisaic fellowships, etc. Many Greek associations met for communal meals only once a month. Um, however, the earliest Christian practice of daily meals is thus noteworthy. Table fellowship denoted intimacy and trust, music or other entertainment, but also discussion and even lectures were frequent at common meals in antiquity. The topic of discussion recommended by Jewish pietists was scripture. In other words, at these, when they would have these dinners, they had them both in the Greco-Roman world and in the Jewish world, and there will be different topics of discussion. What did the Jewish pietists, what did the Jewish people, the rabbis, the scholars, the Pharisees who met together, what did they suggest should be the topic of script, uh, the topic of discussion? Scripture. Okay, so the topic of discussion recommended by Jewish pietists was scripture. Given such background, and especially what this text says about teaching and prayer, possibly including participation in the temple prayers, early Christian fellowships undoubtedly, undoubtedly centered more on intimate worship, sharing, and learning the scriptures and the apostolic message than, than its modern Western counterpart often does. So based upon the cultural context, Dr. Keener says that Probably what was going on here most likely is that because this is what would happen in these Greek, Greco-Roman and Jewish meals that people would have together, the associations, they would have after the meal lectures, topics of discussions would be put forth and somebody would teach on it and then they would discuss it. But at Jewish meals and everybody that we're reading about in Acts chapter two are Jewish at this point, they're all Jewish coming into the church being born again, they're all Jewish. What they would have been talking about is the scriptures. That would have been the topic of discussion. It would have been the scriptures. Um, let me read to you another passage of scripture that supports this. Go to Acts chapter five. Acts chapter five. We're gonna look at verse 42. Acts chapter five, verse 42. And it says, um, this is talking about, again, uh, people coming to faith. It says, verse 41, so they departed from the presence, um, and I believe these are apostles, so they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house, notice, daily in the temple and in every house, some translations read, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Messiah. So from house to house, they are teaching. Look at verse, uh, look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're going to look at verse 20. And again, these are passages Mike didn't read. Mike simply makes the, makes the declaration, the assertion, I should say. He makes the assertion, house to house is not synonymous with church gathering or going from church gathering to church gathering. It just refers to houses. These women are idle. They're going from house to house, people's homes. They're going to different homes and just being gossips. It doesn't refer to, to church gatherings. However, what we're seeing is house to house can refer to people, the church being gathered and being taught. Acts chapter 20, verse 20. Paul is getting ready to leave Ephesus. He's getting ready to leave Ephesus. And he says this to the elders at Ephesus. He says, um, he says to them, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Notice how he taught. I taught publicly and from house to house. So like, like I said before, I read one article person where somebody said, what well, says they were teaching in the temple? And they ate house to house. But if you understand the cultural context, Paul himself said, yeah, I taught publicly, could have been in the temple or it, or it could have been, a, you know, he was in Ephesus, so it could have been in a public area. But he also said, I taught, I taught house to house. So one does not exclude the other. One does not exclude the other. It's two teachings going on, one publicly, one house to house. And who's he teaching house to house? It's believers. He's talking to believers here. Okay. So the church is meeting house to house. They're meeting in different people's housing. And Paul and Peter and others are 
teaching them. Now, remember I said before that in Judaism, they would do this. Their topic of discussion would be the scriptures. Of course, this is what Paul is teaching. But let me read to you what is said in Jewish tradition about what should be done when you're eating a meal together. This is from a book called the Metzuda Pirke Avos, or Pirke Avot. This is the chapter of the fathers. Let me read to you what is said here in Pirke Avot 3.3. Because when I was reading this, I went, wait a minute. Didn't the rabbis teach that when you're sitting together having a meal, you, you should be discussing the Torah? You should be teaching? Yes. So, Pirkei Avot, 3.3, from this book, the Metsuda, Pirkei Avot. It says, Rabbi Shimon says, if three people ate together, notice, three people ate together at a table without speaking words of Torah, it is as if they had eaten or sacrificed, it is as if they had eaten of sacrifices offered to the dead, in other words, to idols. As it is said, all their tables are full of filth without room, quoting Isaiah 28, 8. But if three ate at a table and spoke words of Torah, it is though they had eaten from the table of God, as it is said, he said to me, this is a table which is in the presence of God. By the way, find it interesting. They said if, if, if three ate at a table, it is if they're eating in the presence of God. If they're eating at a table speaking Torah, it is if they are eating in the presence of God, which sounds sim similar to something Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Just throwing it out there, okay? So anyway, the rabbis of Israel here said that when you are gathered together to eat, just like Craig Keener has said, Dr. Keener said, it's a time of intimacy. It is a time of sharing. And within Jewish culture, what are you going to share? You're going to share Torah. What is Torah teaching? God is instruction. You're going to be sharing lessons. You're going to be sharing teachings from the Torah. So in other words, it is within the cultural context to meet house to house and to eat together and to teach. This is part of the culture. Okay, so it's not strange. It is not weird. It is part of the culture. Okay, so... Let me read to you one more thing, because again, we're seeing that house to house teaching is going on, and it is the church that is being taught. One more scripture, Acts chapter 8. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, look at verse, let's look at verse 1, and then we're going to read to verse 3. Now Saul, this is before he had come to faith in Christ, the Apostle Paul, this is Saul, he was consenting to his, Stephen's, death in chapter 7. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Again, some translations read house to house. When you look it up in the Greek, it's the same phrase in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. Okay, Saul made havoc and he entered every house, or he went from house to house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Who is Saul dragging? Who is, uh, who is Saul dragging? How do I want to say this? Saul is going to house to house and dragging out people. Who are the people that he's dragging out? Believers. He's dragging out what we what were later to be called Christians. Well, why is he going to house to house and taking these believers to prison? Why is he wrecking havoc house to house? Because that's where the believers are. The believers in Yeshua. He's not just randomly going to any house pulling people. He's going to where believers meet. He's going to where believers are being taught. He is going to where these believers are professing faith in Yeshua, and they are being taught the doctrine, the teachings of the apostles and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people, he's taking to prison. What's my point again? People are meeting house to house, the church, okay? So it's plausible then that these women in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, are spreading false teaching house to house because we've established teaching was going on from house to house. Churches were meeting in houses. They were meeting from house to house. The apostles were going from house to house. Paul went from house to house teaching. This was taking place even in Ephesus. So it is plausible 
that the women were spreading false teaching house to house and therefore throughout the church because the church was meeting house to house. It is in the church, it is in the houses that believers were receiving instruction and teaching. So it is possible that these women, it is plausible, I'll put it like that, that these women are, when they're going to house to house, they are spreading false teachers, false teachings to members of the household, um, excuse me, to members of the believing community, and that it is spreading throughout the community. That is plausible. Mike saying house to house is not synonymous with house church or church gathering is beside the point, and it's a moot point. We Because we have evidence from scripture itself that this is how teaching in the first century church was done. How was it done? House to house. That is how it was done. There is a saying even in, I, I didn't look it up, but it's in Peter K. Vo, where it says, make your house the, the place where the rabbis teach. I forget the exact quote, but it's like, let your house uh, be a meeting place for the rabbis. In other words, rabbis would go to houses to teach. Jesus would go. Remember, Jesus went to Mar Martha's house. And what was he doing? Teaching Mary. Mar he went to Mary and Martha's house, and he's teaching in the house. Teaching house to house was normal. And so the idea of saying, well, but it's not a church gathering. It doesn't mean it's a church gathering. It's a moot point. The point is, People would gather in homes to be taught. We see that the early church was gathering in homes to be taught. Whether you want to say it was a church gathering or not, it's the church. They're gathering in a house. How could you say it's not a church gathering? That would be like if I... No, so let me say this. If, if Matter of fact, we're planning to do something with our fellowship, the Oasis, where everybody's going to come to our house. We're going to have a time where we get together. So the church will be gathered in Michael's house. If I teach... And Karen teaches, and Aaron teaches, and somebody else teaching, there is teaching going on in the church, even though my house is not a public church. But what, but does that mean that we're not teaching people? Yes, we are teaching people. What if we're teaching people something that is heretical? It is still the church being taught. You see what I'm the point that I'm making? It doesn't have to be, quote, a church gathering, or it doesn't have to be a house church in order for false teaching to be disseminated to the church that's in the house. Does that make sense? So this is why I say, with respect, Mike's point really is irrelevant. It's a moot point. It's beside the point to say, well, it these women weren't going from church gathering to church gathering. They were going to places that we have established in the mouth of two or three witnesses that the church, the believing community, would meet house to house for what purpose? To receive instruction, okay? So it is plausible that these women are spreading teachings from house to house. And when Paul says in Titus chapter one, verse 11, that these false teachers are subverting whole households, it would make sense, even if it's not a church gathering, if they're going into the place where the church often gathers in order to receive teaching, and the teaching is wrong, the teaching is going to impact the households, okay? Matter of fact, uh, as I said before, I think Mike is, it was, I was saying earlier, or alluding to, Mike is making an unnecessary distinction and point regarding the house to house and household. It's, it's, it's an unnecessary distinction he's making. He says the language of first, excuse me, he says the language in Titus 111 about households is unsure. I said, okay, that it could refer to house churches or just to people's home. He states that in 1 Timothy 5.13, there is nothing to indicate that house churches, uh, the house to house indicates house churches. The implication being that the women were not false teachers going to house to house spreading false doctrine or false teaching. But again, this is unnecessary. This is an unnecessary distinction, unnecessary argument. It is why I say it is not well-researched and it's not well thought out. The false teaching being spread was affecting households. It was affecting families. More specifically, it was affecting the social order. Let me read to you 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. See, this teaching wasn't just about the nature of God or the nature of the Trinity or the hypostatic union. This teaching was not just about imputation and righteousness. Is it forensic righteousness? Or, it, you know, it wasn't about is penal substitution a thing. This is not 
just what was going on in the churches. They were teaching practical things about how people should live. And this heretical teaching that was going on was disrupting families. It was disrupting the social order. First Timothy chapter four, verses one through three. Now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to receive, to be received with thanksgiving, thank, with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So one of the things that the false teaching, the false doctrine was creating was an aversion to certain foods. And it was teaching people to not get married, which would mean not to have children. This was one of the results of the false teaching. Okay. Um, Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. Now, remember, in verse 13, talks about these women who are idle, gossips, busybodies, saying things which they are not. Verse 14, Paul says, Therefore, I desire that the younger woman marry, bear children, manage the household, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, why is that important? Notice here, Paul tells the women to marry. This is contrary to the false doctrine, which says, don't get married. He's telling them to have children, which contradicts and counteracts the false teaching. He tells them to manage their household. Not managing their household, and I would argue going out and being a busybody means that they're not managing their household. I'm going to explain that in detail the next time we get together, Lord willing, that this is a, a result of the false teaching. Okay? These negative behaviors of not being married, not managing their household, um, not bearing children, within the context of the first century, these, these negative behaviors were seen as vices and they were seen as subversive to Roman order and stability, okay? If you were not taking care of your household, if you were refusing to marry and to not have children, this could be seen as subversive to Roman order and to the Roman, uh, to Roman order and stability. This is why doing the opposite behaviors, matter of fact, being a busybody and teaching these things, teaching people not to marry, all of that was seen as subversive and it was a vice. Doing the opposite behavior, having children, managing your household, um, marrying, all of these things, let me, let me put it in order, marrying, having children, and managing your household, these were seen as virtues in the first century Greco-Roman world. They were seen as virtues. To say it another way, by not doing these things, getting married, having children, managing your household, these would open the believers up to criticism and accusation from their neighbors and from the government, from the, op from the empire. This would put them in danger. This would be seen as subversive behaviors. This is why Rome didn't like groups to really meet together because they believe this is where sedition happens. This is how groups start to rise up and it threatens the stability of Rome. And not being, not choosing not to marry, teaching people not to marry, teaching people not to have children, not managing your household, that was seen as vice. It was seen as subversive to Greco-Roman culture. And as I said before, to do these behaviors, to marry, have children, manage the household, because women were seen as managers of household. Now, listen, when we say that women were seen as managers of household, this, and I'm going to do a teaching on this in more depth and detail. This is not me like, oh, women just had to stay at home and they um, uh, just had to keep house and they couldn't go out and do anything. No, usually if you're a manager of a household, you have slaves. <laughs> you're, you're, you're managing an estate, okay? We'll go into more detail about this in the future. But they were managing their household, meaning that they were managing the servants, meaning that they were... Um, making sure that things were being taken care of, all right? This was considered honorable. This was considered virtuous. It was considered to be pious behavior or piety or pietist. We've talked about this before, godly behavior. Christopher Hudson, in his Padea commentary on First and Second Timothy and Titus, this is what he says. The threefold wish to marry, bear children, and manage the household describes the ideal Roman mater familias or the mother of the family, the mother of the household. 
She is a, it, it, it portrayed a model of temperance as a wife, mother, and mistress of the household, meaning she was showing that she had self-control. And that was one of the highest virtues that you could, that you could possess. So if you were to marry, if you were to um, have children and you manage the household, you were seen as a very virtuous and honorable woman in first century, in the first century Greco-Roman world. So the false teaching, as I said before, led to the opposite behavior. It led to what would be called ungodly behavior by Greco-Roman standards and by Jewish and Christian standards. This in turn led to the disruption of the social order of the household. Remember we said before in Titus, it talks about their entering in, disrupting hold households. If you're going into household and teaching people not to marry, not to have children, which means you're teaching them not to have sex. So they're not having children and you're teaching them to, and your teaching results in them not managing their households. This is seen as disrupting the household. This is seen as disrupting the household and it is the fruit of the false teaching. Uh, in the book, Civilized Piety, the author says this, throughout the pastoral epistles, the author depicts the opponents, the false teachers, as disruptive of the social order of the household, particularly within the domain of women. These false teachers are disrupting household, particularly or especially in the domain or world of the women. So again, to say that, uh, well, there's no false teaching. No, the false teaching, it, see, the false teaching is not just dealing with well, let's talk about penal substitution. Is that biblical or not? Let's talk about the Trinity. Is there really a Trinity? This is not the type of false teaching that's going on. The, the type of false teaching that's going on has to do with how people are living their lives day by day. This is why I say it's a mute point to say, well, these are not house churches. These are just household. Yes. And the false teachings, if that's true, even if it's and even if it's true, the false teaching are disrupting these households. That is, it is disrupt it is disrupting the families. And see, we have to understand this is the mistake I think Mike Winger makes and some others make. Dr. John Walton says the Bible, while written for well, the Bible while for us, was not originally written to us. If we read these things from our 21st century Western perspective. We will think that Paul is making a point to us today on the basis of our 21st century Western experience. Paul was talking to people living in first century Greco-Roman, uh, first century Greco-Roman world. They were living in the and under the Roman Empire. They had first century Greco-Roman concerns. They did not have 21st century Western and especially American concerns. They had first century Greco-Roman concerns. This is what he's speaking to. If you miss that, you will end up misinterpreting the text. And so what Paul is saying is, hey, these are people going in and they are disrupting households and they're doing it from house to house. And it doesn't matter if it's a house church or not, because if it is a house church, the teaching is still going to the families and disrupting the families. If it's not a house church, but it is a place, houses, where people are meeting to receive instruction, in other words, the church are meeting in the houses, it is still the same effect. People are receiving false teaching that's disrupting the social order, that's disrupting the families. Okay, so it's the same effect. And this puts the church in a dangerous position because Rome will be looking at it and go, hey, you guys are teaching things that are contrary to our traditions. You're teaching things that are subversive to the Roman empire, to the Roman state. You're teaching things that will disrupt our prosperity and our peace. If you understand the cultural context, and I've talked about this before. So does it really matter? if house to house in 1 Timothy 5.13 is referring to a house church? No, it really doesn't. I think it could be because as we said, as we saw before, the church met house to house to receive teaching and instruction. But if you want to argue, hey, it's just houses. Hey, but people still met, the believers still met house to house to receive teaching and instruction, okay? And they would receive, in house to house is where the teaching and training of believers took place, whether for good or for ill. The teaching took place both in the Greco-Roman world and in the Jewish world and in the Christian world. Teachings would take place in household for good or for ill. 
And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, and in 1 Timothy and the pastoral epistles overall, we see that the effect of the false teachings were for ill. They were for ill. They were wrecking um, havoc in the churches. They were causing disruptions in families, in households. So I disagree with Mike Winger to say that no, house to house cannot refer to these women going and spreading false teachers. They were just being gossips and they were being idols, idol, and they were just traveling to each other's homes. It doesn't have to do with teaching. We saw that that is not the case. A plausible argument can be made that teachings were taking place house to house, that people were receiving instruction, and part of the instruction was bad instruction coming from the false teachers. Now, next week, I am going to get into, well, when it says that they were gossips and busybodies, isn't that just means that they were just talking about people? That hasn't anything to, that doesn't have anything to do with false teaching. We're going to cover that next week. We're going to look at what Mike Winger says. We're going to look at what other complementarian author says. And I'm going to bring you some more evidence from the cultural background and context. Okay. Hope you got a lot out of this. I hope this was clear. Um, we're going to be uploading this within the next 24 hours to our website, KIC TV, where you, uh, KIC TV, keeping it in context. Um, that's our YouTube channel, I should say. And there you can find all the teachings on who's the boss. We've got 72 teachings now total. We got Old Testament teachings. We got New Testament teachings. As I said, a friend of mine refers to, to this as the never ending servant. It will come to end one day. But we got 72 teachings. We're going into depth and detail because we are dealing with very seriously, what does the Bible say about the authority of men and women, especially of women? Are women prohibited? I don't think they are. That's why we're going to such depth and detail. All right. So if you're watching this on our KIC TV YouTube channel, please hit the like bu button. Please subscribe. That helps to push the algorithm out. And also share this video with other people, especially if you got people saying, Mike Winger did a bang up job. He slam dunked it. He is debunked egalitarianism. Point them to these videos. We offer plausible and I believe um, accurate pushback to Mike Winger's series. All right. Thank you very much. Lord willing, we will see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.